and CEO of the Executives Club of Chicago. Uh, welcome to this program. We're really excited about it. We really love to host book events here with our good friends at the American Writers Museum because it's indoctrinating you as an American writer with all these other great writers. So it's a, it's a fun way to do these events. And if you have not been to this museum before, it really is incredible. Check it out. It's going to be open during the reception and come back sometime because there's a lot back here that you can't see that you can come when you uh, visit at another time. But it's really great. And thank you to our friends here for hosting us. They're always so generous with us. Um, I also would like to thank all of our season sponsors who make programming at the club possible. And a big thank you to EO, the Entrepreneurs Organization of Chicago, for their partnership in today's program. I know a bunch of you are here with us. It's good to see you. And so just a few quick technical notes. You can submit questions to Andy and Jasmine. I know she has a lot that she wants to get through, but she will be keeping an eye on your questions. You just text EXEC, E-X-E-C, to 22333. Um, and that's, you'll see it on the screens, and it's also in the program. And we have a QR code on the program. You can access a digital version of today's brochure, and then more information about today's program, submitting questions, and then more information on what's happening at the Exec Club. We do have the book stall here this evening for everyone who wants to purchase Andy's book. I know you all do, so they're here for that. And then in addition, I invite you all to join us for other upcoming events. We have a lot of incredible speakers coming this season. It's really fantastic. Thank you for kicking us off and setting the bar high. And then we have a lot of great other speakers coming, both virtually and in person. So that's all on the website, and I think you can access that in the QR code, too. So thank you for joining us. We're thrilled to welcome Andy and Jasmine. Testing. OK, we're live. Well, so excited to be here today, um, and definitely excited to be speaking with Andy. I know you all are as well, and that is why you came right after work. You rushed here to get a front row seat. Um, we're going to be learning more about his life. Um, we're going to be talking about his book. And also, we're going to be talking about some things that he's going to get really vulnerable with us today. So have your questions. And you didn't I'll tell me about that know. part. Yes, that's, sure. that's okay. happening as well, right. just so you know. Uh, so whatever questions you have, submit them here. And at the end, we definitely will make some time. So to kick it off, Andy. Hi. Hi, Jasmine. Before we jump into the book, I think we will all love to hear a little bit more about your background and your story. So with you being a native Chicagoan, the first thing that the audience, I'm sure, is dying to know, Cubs or Sox? So I, I was at game seven <laughs> cheering for the Indians. No. Um, <laughs> I actually thought the world was, might end. You know what I mean? Like I grew up, my dad is, let's see, he was born in 46. And the last time the Cubs had gone to the World Series is 45. So he was like, this is never going to happen in my lifetime. And then we were at, well, we shouldn't talk too much. We were at game five and they were down and I was with my, my now wife, maybe my then wife, my then wife, my mom and dad, same person, by the way, now and then. <laughs> and, uh, you know, whatever, they came back. And then being at the game, I was like, they won, now what? Like, I thought maybe the screen would just go black, you know, directed by... Theo Epstein, executive producer, God, and just done. And then life went on, and so Cubs. Got it, got it. So don't, um, you know, kick me out or anything, but I'm a Sox fan. Is that, is that okay? Okay, we got some Sox folks here. You know, we have to have the diversity up here, all right? Yeah. The other thing that I think is really interesting, talking about your, your family is, that your sibling, he's an entrepreneur too. So, you know, did your parents raise you both to be this way? Or how did that come about that two of you kind of ended up They're being confused. Founders? They're confused about it. They don't know how it happened. So my mom is a Punjabi Indian immigrant uh, born in a refugee town on the way from Rawalpindi, Pakistan to New Delhi, India at the time of the partition. Uh, two million dead um, out of 14 million displaced. So she was born in that context. Um, Dad is a Scandinavian, Midwestern white dude, uh, you know, Danish, Swedish, Norwegian, all of that. So we were raised in a pretty stimulating uh, biracial environment, but we didn't, we weren't aware of it. You know what I mean? Like we weren't aware. I wasn't aware of it until someone at school in high school called me a Windu. I was like, what's a Windu? And he was like, it's a white Hindu. Oh. 
and it just like took off. And I was upset and I came home and I told my parents, I was like, they're calling me a Windu. And they both just started dying laughing. <laughs> Encouraging parents. <laughs> they did, yeah. Hey, and yeah, go ahead. My sister, my older sister, Monica, who has a business here in town, mm -hmm. she like gathered that this wasn't okay and she was two and a half years older. Mm -hmm. So she told a bunch of her friends to go intimidate those people. And so I got a very protective older sibling and now we're, we're reunited. I was in New York for the last 15 years and my wife and I, our little boy, Isaiah, just moved here uh, last year. So we're back home. That's awesome. And yeah, you know, we know that you went to Northwestern and Stanford, and that's also where you met your, your co-founder. So we'd love to even understand, like, was there a pivotal moment that kind of led you to, to start your company? Yeah, the Chicago um, tech scene is so different now. Like 2004, 2005, when I was last here, I would have an idea and be like, I need to find someone to raise money from for this. And the one I was really excited about was, you know, the, the restaurant, the Pita Inn on Dempster in Skokie. I was like, this falafel is just too good to be limited to Skokie. So I went to the people that own it and I was like, let's franchise. And they were like, we don't need you for that. But I figured, I figured if we, you know, could raise some money for it, maybe. And I went around and I had this whole presentation and it was all about how like hummus was rising in the American grocery channel and like, falafel vegetarian sandwiches and I like went door to door with all these people in Chicago to raise money and it was like zero now part of that was maybe the idea part of it was me so I left in part because I felt like I wanted to go somewhere that have more of a startup mindset and that was Stanford mm -hmm. and had a great experience there and then moved to New York which is where we built Bonobos and it's refreshing to be back in Chicago now because it doesn't resemble at all the place that I remember at all and you know we have entrepreneurs like you doing amazing things and it's wonderful to be an angel investor in your company um so i'm i'm so optimistic because of people like you that we're on a new new track oh i appreciate that no i mean the chicago scene has changed a lot even from my short period of time you know doing this work i've seen it so i would love to kind of hear from you you know what do you think you've seen to be like the biggest kind of shift within the chicago tech scene well, look, I think that it's about the ecosystem of investors mm -hmm. is the start. And then you kind of need like, I don't know if it's the right term to use in this town, but you need like the mafia from those companies to spin out, right? And so if you think about the history of the Valley, like PayPal is such an interesting story, not because of what happened there, but because of the like 2000 descendant companies that came out of PayPal. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we need that here. And at one point we had Groupon and then we kind of, you know what I mean? Like it's been a bit of a lull and there's so much capital and talent going in that my wife's thesis and mine is that if we can have the next five or seven great American companies emerge here, those ecosystems will, will start to flourish and produce other entrepreneurs and more investors and all that. And so I think the difference is now, although you probably would say it hasn't been a cakewalk raising money, mm -hmm. there is an ecosystem putting capital in. And now we need to translate that into to great companies that emerge, that create economic value and jobs, and then those employees spin off and we do the PayPal mafia thing, but we do it here. Right. Now we need to just create like a mafia here next. Yes. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. This metaphor Check. is in Five trouble. Five mafia. We'll I'm working on it. Yeah. Perfect. So thinking about great ideas, great companies, you know, you started one of those. What do you think really led you to come up with the idea? You know, I see PETA didn't work out, so you had to shift a little bit, so. Yeah, from PETA to pants, actually, <laughs> is what I should have. Called it, right, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that, I love this saying that the future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed. So people who, quote unquote, invent the future usually do it by noticing something in the present that's just in the corner. I think I'm borrowing that from Sam Altman. And also great entrepreneurs are usually thieves, <laughs> which is to say the probability that any one person comes up with it is lower than the fact that they saw it somewhere else and figured out how to adopt it. So for me, that was when I was a second year analyst working in a consulting firm, Bain here in Chicago, I got staffed to go up to Dodgeville, Wisconsin, lovely town, just Northwest of Madison. And there was a, a catalog retailer base there, anyone? Land's End, and Sears had just acquired Land's End. 
This was back in 02. So I was the two, two years out of college person staffed to what was called a PMI. I was like, what's that? Post-merger integration. I was like, all right, that sounds like navigating shit shows. And spent some time in Wisconsin and seeing like the Sears Hoffman Estates culture collide with this Dodgeville, Wisconsin culture. And like, how do you integrate that? And I was in a meeting once about like pink cashmere sweaters. And the cool thing about a catalog is you can aggregate demand nationally from all the potential customers for a product. Whereas at a store, you have to assort it locally. So pink cashmere sweaters are really good to carry in a catalog because there's like 300 or 400 women nationwide that want to make that purchase on any given whatever. But if you want to assort it to a store, you can't. And so there were all kinds of battles like, wait, we can't carry this product anymore because it doesn't work in the store, right? Or Land's End had amazing customer service. I remember walking into their call center and seeing just notes on the wall. And one of them was like, dear Elizabeth, thank you for waking me up the morning of my wedding. My mom was a mess. My bridesmaids wanted to sleep in. You're the best. And I was like, this is a note from a customer to the Land's End call center. Sure, who do you call to wake you up the morning of your wedding? Someone at a call center, right? And it just stuck with me. That just stuck with me. And so fast forward five years later when I was a second year at Stanford and I had a, a very savant-like genius housemate who made a better fitting pair of men's pants. And his whole insight was that he grew up playing hockey and soccer and felt like if his pants fit around his thighs, they were too loose in the waist. And if they fit in his waist, they were too tight in the thighs. He called it like hockey butt. And so he would buy pants that were a size 34 waist to fit his thighs and then tailor them in at the waist, which was like a $50 alteration. So he was like, screw this. I'm going to just get a sewing machine and do it myself. And then got a pattern made and the pants were cool. I actually thought the project was dumb when I first heard about it. I was like, better fitting pants. And then it was working and I was like, well, wait, if Land's End can build a, biz a brand through a catalog, it stands to reason that people will build brands through the internet. And this was in 2007 and there were no examples of brands that were coming up digitally native, but there was this company called Zappos that was selling footwear. And like the rumor was they were doing a lot of sales because they had great customer service. And so that was the idea of like, let's marry Brian's pants that solve the hockey butt thing. Mm -hmm with a digital model that's direct to consumer in the way that a land's end catalog is but using the internet and that was kind of the the non-consensus idea and i think we were lucky that we were in silicon valley at that time because we attracted investors from tech who would normally not have considered investing in an apparel company and then we moved to new york for a bunch of reasons and woke up about five years in and we were like oh shit, we're running an apparel company wow yeah, and I think uh, for the folks from EO here, or even people who maybe have their own companies or aspiring to have their own companies, you know, there's kind of sometimes this belief or this thought that there's a, such a thing as an overnight success, and we all know that that's not a thing. So maybe what's some advice that you would give to um, aspiring founders or current founders who are in the audience today, um, just from even some of your, your lessons learned? Yeah, don't do it. <laughs> Well, it's too late for me. <laughs> oh, shoot. It's too late. It's funny. I was talking to um, Ev Williams in San Francisco about two months ago. He was a co-founder of Twitter, mm -hmm. CEO of Twitter for a period of time. Then he started a thing called Medium, which for the writers in the room is one of the writing platforms out there. And he was the CEO and founder of Medium for 10 years. Before that, he started Blogger. So blogging, you know, short form Twitter and then long form. And I saw him, he's like, did you see the news yesterday? And I was like, no, what's the news? And he was like, I stepped down from medium. And I, this is mean maybe, but I just started laughing. Cause I was like, why is it that these things always start with joy and end with escape? <laughs> you know, like you start it cause you love something. And then you wake up one day and the paradox of success is that you have to keep doing it mm -hmm. if you're fortunate. And then at some point it can become a burden or it can so disrupt your work-life balance is an illusion. Work-life balance is an illusion in so many ways. And that's en that ended up being like the genesis for the book was like telling the dark side of the story 
rather than like pretending like it was a it was a mostly you know monotonically increasing happiness thing when that's just not the truth so i don't mean don't do it do it but you know go in eyes wide open and be prepared to take care of yourself along the way yeah i think that's really good advice i um you know we joke a lot in the founder community that people like to glamorize this lifestyle when really if they knew what it was like day in day out um, they liken it to being on a roller coaster where you have these really high highs um, but you also have really low lows so um, you know I think that what you say there is is really important and very very accurate and true kind of shifting more into like the dark side right and you sharing more about what you talked about in the book and also even more just with everything around mental illness and talking more about that for founders and not just even for founders, but for people in, in general. Can you tell us more about your journey as an entrepreneur um, with the mental illness? Yeah, for sure. So when I was a senior in college at Northwestern, I was 20, I had what's called a manic episode. It's basically psychosis and delusion generally if you go to the, the DSM criteria, the fancy word, it would be like delusions of grandeur, messianic zeal, elevated speech, rapid cycling of moods. Um, maybe something, if you're not familiar with it, that you'd be familiar with from just seeing people out on the street, like the, the intersection of homelessness and mental illness might make this familiar if, if, if you're fortunate enough to not be familiar in your, in your own lives. I had that psychotic break came out of nowhere and my parents came up to evanston through a bunch of like jedi moves with my friends got me to the hospital hospital called good samaritan hospital in downers grove where my mom actually worked uh, as an ultrasound tech where i had worked which added to the humiliation after being discharged and i spent a week there and coming out at the end of the week i was diagnosed with this thing bipolar disorder type one and it just hit me like a sledgehammer, mostly because it's like I just had regained my sanity and barely remembered the contours of what had happened from the psychosis. And now all of a sudden, here's this thing. And the language that we use around bipolar disorder is tough because what we tend to say is someone is bipolar, which is like saying someone is cancer. Right. And I think you probably have all heard this. Oh, she's bipolar. He's bipolar. You would never say that. Of, you would never say she's cancer. That would be like a weird thing to say. But we equate the identity and the illness together when it comes to a lot of mental illnesses. So the first part was grappling with the fact that now this was felt like it was some kind of stain upon me that I was going to carry forever. And then the implications of that stain. So the I looked it up, the suicide rate for bipolar one, the attempt rate is 60% and the suicide rate is 19%. So who wants to be told at 20 years of age, hey, there's a one in five chance you're gonna end your own life. That seems like a hard thing to accept. And then as for the mania part of it, yeah, you just lost your mind, you thought you were God, it's totally cool. And that might just continue to happen to you in your life. Could happen next week or in 10 years, maybe you'll cut your ear off like Van Gogh, don't worry, there's famous people that had this. And it's, it's just a lot to absorb. And so I did what I think what a lot of young people do in the onset of the diagnosis is typically 18 to 25, which is decide like, I don't have that. That just, that didn't just happen. That's not me. And my family being so culturally diverse, one thing in common between the Indians and the Swedes is a desire to not talk about this stuff, right? We were unified in that regard. It was like Fight Club. You don't talk about Fight Club. Like that didn't happen. And it was unfortunate because it did happen. And we had a lot of medical professionals in our family who were very quick to you know, work on the, the physical ailments. But when it came to the mental health one, um, that was challenging. And it was made more tragic by the fact that my grandmother had severe mental illness. And my grandfather, this on my dad's side, became a psychiatrist and actually would have her committed which is not a good look in a marriage, you know? You're going in, literally that kind of, that was the gothic history on my dad's side. And in fact, it trained my dad's family to never talk about it because when Nana would come out of the psychiatric ward, everyone would pretend, including my grandfather, that nothing had happened. Meanwhile, they were World War II heroes and had been on the European front 
and had all this PTSD that was another thing. So, you know, you have these people that survived a war on one side, refugees on the other side, and all these medical professionals. And yet for the diagnosis that came from me, it was like, let's pretend that that didn't happen. And I was leading the charge with that because I didn't want to believe it. So I was really closeted about it, um, including with myself for the better part of the 16 years that followed that diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and it seems like, you know, we've started to see that there's a lot more education and, and people being more open to talking about these things. Like even yourself coming up here to say, hey, I wrote a book that talked about this in my life and you know how it impacted people who are close to me and how I'm dealing with that. I think that is very helpful and it just continues to bring a lot more light to, hey, a lot of people deal with this and there should be just more understanding of it. Um, you know, can you also share with the audience, just like even day to day, what it's like um, living with bipolar disorder type one? Yeah, so the, the wake up call for me was came 16 years later. So when I started Bonobos, you were talking about the roller coaster, I started to move in and out of the highs and the lows. And the two mood states that are, let's say in between mania and psychosis and being institutionalized and suicidal, are what I would call like catatonic depression or and mild depression and then hypomania. And hypomania is basically elevated speech, rapid ideation, exuberance, contagious positive energy, a little bit of irritability and distractibility, more or less like the central casting qualities of an entrepreneur having a good day, right? Like this is what we expect. In, and then depression being like, hey, this isn't gonna work, I'm not feeling well. And so that, the illness almost cloaked, you know, was cloaked by the job because we come to expect that of the role. And I lived between those two zones for eight years. And when I was in the hypomanic phase, that was like jet fuel for being an entrepreneur. I had a lot of energy. I was able to raise over a hundred million dollars, recruited 600 people. That was kind of like, hey, let's go do this. Let's go change the world. We're selling pants over the internet. I don't know how you change the world with that idea, but we did it. <laughs> let's go sell some pants, right? Let's go. And then on the depressive side, I would just withdraw and kind of hide from, from work. So I would take, I would set up calendar appointments during the day and go home and sleep because I couldn't make it through the day. Or I would say I was fundraising and, and maybe I would be and maybe I wouldn't be. And then through the whole while, um, alcoholism, you know, lots of intersecting issues with my personal life that, that are so common of um, living between the extremes. And then the thing that happened that cemented the fact that the diagnosis had been accurate was in 2016, I had a second um, catastrophic manic episode and it was the second time I would be hospitalized. And one of the pernicious things about mania is it can be triggered by positive life events. So the positive event in my case was I was um, summoning the courage to ask my then girlfriend to marry me. I was excited about it. She was out of town. I was going to do it when she got back. I stayed out, I was drinking, I was having a good time. And she came back and I was in the throes of what I would call a, a hypomanic state that was escalating upwards. And I had told her that I had the, this history, but I kind of buried the lead. I was like, well, this thing happened to you when I was in college and... I've been using drugs and they kind of think it wasn't this, but I got diagnosed with this. And she was like, all right, there's that thing there. But I, I kind of swept it under the rug as we had done as a family. And in fact, this turned into full-blown mania. I ended up at Bellevue Hospital in New York, which has got the big psychiatric ward. I spent a week there. I came back down from the, the delusion and the psychosis. And it was a different world than when I was 20. You know, I was 36 years old. I had 600 employees. Uh, I had a, a real partner in my life for the first time. My family was amazing. Like everyone was, everyone got it at this point. We'd all grown up a lot and the world had changed a lot. And it was like, okay, this is what we're dealing with it. Let's deal with it. And I was so excited to do that. Like, I need to get healthy now and walked out of the hospital ready to dig into that work. And I walked straight into handcuffs. And I was arrested for felony and misdemeanor assault. If you want to read the book, that's the rest that goes from there. 
Um, but that's, that's what happened. And so I'll, I'll save some of the details for the reading. But it was a, it was a hellish year. It was a hellish year from there. Um, wondering if, you know, I was going to be fired, if, you know, I didn't want to live. I didn't know if I'd lose Manuela. Um, and, you know, just frankly didn't know if I was going to be able to put the pieces back together after that. And so how did we get through it? We got through it through good fortune and privilege and family. So the family part is that everyone rallied around me. Um, my now wife stayed with me and she was really clear. She said, actually her mom led the charge. So I, I sat down with her mom who was there for um, the episode, um, Jewish woman from Newark, New Jersey. We sat down for lunch. And the last time I had seen her, I had assaulted her. And so I, I, I couldn't even picture what the conversation would be like. I had just been out of the hospital. At the time, I wasn't able to see Manuela because there was a restraining order against me because I had struck her during the manic violence. And I sat down and uh, Baba, as I call her, put her hand on my hand and she said, Andy, it's just like diabetes. You got to take your meds. And if you do, I'm good with you. If Manuela is. Literally just like that. And just the tears streaming down my face because finally, finally someone in my life equated the mental illness to a physical illness. They said, this is no different. But it's not unconditioned love that we're offering you. It's conditioned upon you taking care of yourself. And I think that's the, that's the thing that was so redeeming for me was not only was I accepted by this other family, uh, but I was accepted with a condition of taking care of myself. And so I spent the next six months, definitely didn't want to live. I was so ashamed of the violence. The high, high of mania is so often followed by this long catatonic depression. I felt suicidal every day, but I also felt an accountability to make good on the love that others were offering me. And that ties into the privilege then, which is I had a great doctor, a great doctor, a guy in the book I refer to as Dr. Z. He's amazing. He's a psychiatrist and a therapist, both, which is hard to find because generally you have to go see the psychiatrist if you need medication and the therapist for the therapy. And so Dr. Z is both, which meant I didn't have to duplicate the story. And there was also a, a cadence to it of, he was like, you probably need to be here three times a week. And I was like, okay. So three times a week, I'd make my way to lower Manhattan for 45 minutes. And his hourly rate is $1,100. So it's $160,000 a year to see him three times a week. And the mental health uh, reimbursement is virtually non-existent in our society. If you're lucky, you have dental and vision. So you can smile and see, but you're otherwise effed <laughs> as far as your brain goes. And the reimbursement rate's 9%. So I fell into a tiny sliver of society where I could afford the health care that I needed. And that's a fundamental injustice that we need to address. And a lot of people, talented people, are working on addressing it. And then um, built a whole lifestyle around staying healthy. So massive reduction in all kinds of unhealthy habits. And then the cornerstone of which is sleep. And so every morning I send a sleep report on WhatsApp. I can add you to it if you'd like to be on it. It's um, I sent it to my mom, sister, wife, and doctor, and that's foundational. Like if I sleep five or six hours plus, we're in a great place on insulating from hypomania. And if I'm like under eight, we're, we're kind of in a great place on not being depressive. And so daily medication, sleep report, great doctor, start to build other um, healthy habits around that. It takes a lot. And I've been, you know, very fortunate to be able to have all those ingredients to get back to health. And, you know, now it's been five years since I've had any, um, let's call it non out of the bounds, ups or downs. I have a lot of days now that are like a steady five out of 10. 
how do you feel today? I feel fine. My doctor's like, yeah, that's life. <laughs> like, that's good. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I'm not excited about anything. He's like, do you feel low? I was like, no. He's like, this is good. Yeah. You know? For sure. Um, you know, something that I kind of want us to talk about is, you know, you speak about having like the privilege to have a great doctor and all that, or even how for folks to be able to get that and re reimburse through insurance is really tough. So I know that in here, there's also a lot of people who maybe are CEOs or, you know, have the ability to, you know, do things even within the workplace. And I think this is one of the questions that also came through and continue to send your questions in, but also one of the questions we wanted to ask as well. Yeah. But the question that um, I'll read it directly off the screen says, knowing what you know now, how would you suggest organizations best support people that may have different mental health challenges or neurodiversities? So, you know, speaking to folks in this room or even thinking about yourself having a company that had over 600 people in it, yeah. you know, what would you kind of offer as advice? Yeah. So I think there's at the first, first is the disclosure part. So I think we need to, and part of the goal of the book was just normalizing disclosures like this one. And I think it's incumbent upon leaders, founders, executives to role model the same thing in their enterprises. And so at some point, um, sharing your vulnerability with your team. And I think the, what I would offer is that it's amazing to invite the empathy of others rather than to project strength because people lean into that. And so my, my pitch to CEOs and my pitch to executives is find a moment at a fireside chat once a year to just spend five or 10 minutes on what's going on for you in your life, including the hard stuff. And if you have a story as colorful as this one, maybe take some more time and find a moment to share it because it, it creates a safe space and a norm that that disclosure is okay. And so I think that's step one. And with, um, with bipolar disorder, it's 3%, we think of the general population. Index is seven to one in entrepreneurs. So that might be one in five. And it definitely over indexes in all other forms of leadership and creativity. We don't know why. Does doing this stuff, quote unquote, make you crazy or does it attract? You know, the crazy ones who's more of a stigmatized word now, but I think no, no one will be that surprised. <laughs> like I can remember disclosing, Hey, I have this thing I've been dealing with, you know, after I came out of the hospital and there was a lot of like, mm -hmm. <laughs> like there, it wasn't like, oh, what you have a mood disorder. Like we would never have known working with you for the last decade. People are smart. People are intuitive and they know that the human experience is hard and actually it's very connecting to disclose because it, it makes space. The second thing we have to do is create training for everyone to be able to be on the receiving end of that disclosure. Because if I'm an employee in an organization without authority, I'm probably not going to jump to my boss or HR. I'm going to tell a friend. I'm going to tell someone I work with. Maybe I'll tell my manager if they're a really good manager. Now that person is not a mental health professional, right? My wife has reminded me of this because I've gotten about 4,000 messages since I wrote the book. And at one point I'm like up late. She's like, you probably shouldn't be up in the middle of the night responding to people who you know are struggling. Like you're a mental health patient, not a mental health professional. And so how, what do we do in our organizations if we're going to encourage disclosure and your average person doesn't know what to do with that? So luckily someone already figured this out. It's called jack.org. They offer a 20 minute training that is a certificate that anyone can go and get on how to handle a conversation about disclosure. It's really cool. I took it and I got like 50% of the questions wrong because I've never been trained. I've, I'm, I'm just the person who's been disclosing this, mm -hmm. right? Um, you mentioned the word neurodiversity. This is a great brand for mental health. Mental health issues, mental health, who wants to say that? Neurodiversity, now we're talking right? Because our brains are all different. And so having an ERG, I mean, I would, I would invite everyone to consider how effective their ERGs are, but assuming you're running an ERG program that's effective, maybe you have Jasmine's help with that with her enterprise, you got to have a neurodiversity ERG and it's got to mean something. Um, and that, that leads to the hardest part. The hardest part is the money, which is we have to invest behind our employees' mental health 
And unfortunately, the reimbursement is not there. And so what I'm seeing some enterprising people and companies do is offering each employee a $2,000 a year stipend for non-reimbursable expenses for their mental health. And that's cool because that at least enables you to get to, let's say, you know, 20 therapy sessions for $100 out of pocket. There are some open questions around like governance and how do you do that and how do you figure it out? And it's, I've seen a couple of companies that are pioneers at this where someone's like, well, a vacation is good for my mental health. And you know, now someone's buying themselves like my ties on the beach, like that's probably not the right length to go to, but um, we need to invest. And we know insurance companies aren't going to. Um, got, the government's got a lot of fish to fry, you know? So let's hope for government policy change to the extent that that's what we're rooting for. The money's gonna have to come from corporations. And so we need to inspire and cajole. And if you're invested with that authority in this room, take that role now and say, you know, we're here for you, your mental health and we'll, we'll step up and we'll offer some additional reimbursement since it's so hard to afford the out-of-pocket. Yeah, and I think, you know, considering the motivations behind writing the book, I'm sure, you know, talking more about mental health um, your journey with mental health and bringing more light to that was one of them. But what else was the motivation and also why, why now? So the main thing was I was so angry for the two decades I felt ashamed. I felt like, I felt like there was something wrong with me for so long, so much so that I had to repress the fact that it even happened. And so, you know, I started spending some time like understanding shame. And I guess one of the definitions of shame is that shame is what is unspeakable. Right? So if you speak it, then maybe then you're not ashamed of it. Or being able to say like, this isn't shameful. This wasn't my fault. Great scene, Robin Williams, Matt Damon, Good Will Hunting. It's not your fault. And so painful in retrospect to know that mental illness claimed, claimed his life. And like now when I see that scene, it's not your fault. It's not your fault. Like he was speaking for something so personal. And so it's not your fault, right? And if it's not your fault, then why can't you say it? I assumed I couldn't say it at some point. Let's assume that I could have even said it to myself. I just thought it would be career limiting move. Like I thought if people knew this about me, no one would work for me. No one would give me money to build something. And yet we already are, right? We're already giving money to people who are facing all kinds of issues. So that to me was the first goal was to expunge the shame. Um, and then, you know, if you read the book, it's a bit of a love letter to my wife and family. And I felt like their heroism, you know, the untold story of so many of these situations, the ones that go well, it's not the person with the mental illness, it's everyone around them. And it's hard. That it might even be harder. Um, so I wanted to celebrate what they had done and the way that they showed up. And those are the notes that get me are the ones from the moms, you know, who are dealing with the child who just is going through this and like to not be the patient and to be experiencing it, it, it even removes your agency from trying to do something about it. So, um, I wanted to offer some hope to those folks mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. And I think that's a big motivation, right? To, to tell your story and to put it out there. Uh, something else I have to ask is why call it burn rate? So the title was a funny process. So if you're, if you maybe we're in the, we're in a place of writer. So, um, while we were in the process, I didn't have a title and I was really focused on it. And they were like, don't worry, like the title will come in the middle. So one of the people at Penguin Random House who were great and my editor is great. But, but they suggested a title I didn't love, which is Here's to the Crazy Ones, uh, which is off of the Steve Jobs commercial from like the 80s when he came back to Apple. And it's got like, 
MLK Jr. and Gandhi and here's to the crazy ones. And I was like, I really don't like that name. And I had to think about it. I was like, well, first, don't ever compare yourself to Steve Jobs. <laughs> Subliminally, just don't do it. Second, that word crazy. It's like, mm, it's a complicated word. It's a word that I feel like I can use <laughs> if I want to, but I'm not sure if someone who, you know, it gets complicated. So I didn't like that title and we were going through some other titles and, and burn rate came up and it was this attempt to thread the needle around being a part of the startup lore, right? You're like, we're running out of money, which is like the story of every startup. And then, you know, burning the candle at both ends, so to speak. We had a few others and where there was a debate and I was like, let's just put this on Twitter. And so we started running like Twitter polls and burn rate came up. Okay. And last night I was on Instagram looking at paintings for our dining room with my wife. And there's a guy named at paint by Alex who does like pretty hardcore political art. And I was going through it and I saw a painting. I was like, it's a bunch of guys sitting around a, a table having a business meeting and the table is burning. And it's kind of, if you see his work, it's like kind of a critique of capitalism kind of work. And, and there was, was the title, Burn Rate. And I was like, hi, dear DM, at Paint by Alex. Is this painting for sale? <laughs> Put it just right above like the dining room table, like yeah. smack dab right there. Yeah. Um, you know, also just tell us how has reception to the book been so far? As you can see, this place is filled with people, I think, who won you know, want to buy it. We're excited to hear you talk yeah. more about it, have read it. So, you know, can you just even share more about like what the reception has been like? It's been amazing. It's been like jumping into a wall of pillows, you know, like I held so much fear around for so long around this disclosure. And it's been like the opposite of everything I was taught about it is the opposite of true. Like, don't tell someone that it turns out like tell someone that, <laughs> you know, like the thing that you're holding that is your secret. The newsflash is like no one else cares. And I mean that in a nice way. No one's going around wondering, I wonder if Andy has a mental health issue. If he tells me about it, I'm really going to be thinking about that for the next week. You know, like everyone's in their own head, right? We're the center of our own stories. We're worried about our dramas and the dramas of the people around us that we love. For the vast majority of humanity, aka everyone except like the three people you spend your time with, no one cares about you. <laughs> and I mean that in the best possible way. They just don't care. So to the extent that they're going to care, what they're going to care about is your vulnerable disclosure, your real story. Tell me something about you that helps me empathize, right? And feel better about myself. And generally that's not success. Success inspires indifference, sometimes inspiration, often envy. It's like the struggle that we love, right? I mean, I think this group is the right age. It's like the VH1 behind the music. The rise, the fall, the rebirth, right? We love the fall. We do. That's like art. That's, that's the stuff of books. So just offer people to that in your own lives because there's a chance it's there, right? Probably your life hasn't been what others think. There's probably more going on that meets the eye even right now. When you're ready and in the right way at the right time, sharing that, that's the good stuff. Yeah, I know one of the questions that came in, and thanks to everyone who's sending in questions, keep sending them in. We have um, some more time left to cover those. They asked, uh, who do you go to for vulnerability? Um, someone mentioned Brene Brown, but they said, who else, right? Who else should we be listening to or who are you listening to? I don't know. I like the, uh, like the Lyft driver, you know, or like the housekeeper or, you know what I mean? Like there's, we, 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 we occupy like a strata of society as college educated people, probably the most of the people in this room. I don't know. It's like, it's, it's kind of like airbrushed living the dream BS. I found it in Chicago, even here. It's something I'm struggling with is like in New York, someone says like, how are you? And it's like, 
I'm shitty. You know, it's just like there. And, and I feel like it's harder, it's harder to peel back the layers here. And I think we just need to role model. Like when someone says, how are you? Just tell the truth, you know, rather than just being like, I'm good. Think about it. Like, I'm good. Like, am I good? Like, I'm good about 20% of the time. <laughs> so that answer is accurate one in five times, but the other four out of five would be like, not awesome right now. And what will happen is the other person stops because there's probably a good chance they're not awesome right now either. And now we can have like a real conversation. I like grandparents. You know what I mean? Like women over 70, just let's have them run the world. There's just no BS ever. It's amazing. They don't give an F. That's very true. So like, I, I want to spend time around like grandmothers and taxi drivers. And... I love that. Um, a couple other questions that we, we got in. I know we have about five minutes left or so. Uh, someone asked, where did you channel the energy to get the book, right? Uh, to write the book. So where did that kind of come from for you? This will be annoying, but I'm going to go for it. I don't actually think it's that hard to write a book. I don't. I, I do and I don't. You know, I'm, I'm kidding, right? But it was like three to six hours a week compounding over two years. And in my mind, it was like sitting down at a typewriter. People say like, I've been working on the book for two years. And what they mean is like, they've been spending a couple hours a week on a book for two years. Because and it's a little bit liberating, this mindset. We only have probably three good professional hours a day. Like really good creative hours. Our schedule may eclipse that, we may have meetings and obligations, but if we're gonna come up with good thoughts, we've got three hours. And how do you wanna spend those three hours? And it turns out if you choose to spend, let's say two of those three hour sections each week writing, you will wake up in two years and have a book. So if you kind of reframe it from like, I could never write a book to, can I try to write a book with two, three hour sessions once a week, there's a chance you can do it. Now you need some good people around you. You need a story that you want to tell. You need a really good like outline, like a detailed outline of the 20, 30 chapters, kind of like the blueprint. And then just most of the time you feel like, you know what, I'm writing a bad book. That's how it feels. Like you're just like, I'm writing a bad book. I just am. But the discipline of writing, and you all have heard this or read somewhat or practiced it, is like you just write it anyway. You put words down on paper and you don't hold judgment about them. It's like you just free associate and you do it. And this is somewhat unique to writing a memoir because I didn't have to research anything. So I know it's different. It's different than fiction. You know, it's different, whatever. But um, it's, it's eminently doable. Should you want to, should you choose to, if you feel like you have a story to tell, it's not this thing that everyone says is the hardest thing ever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So two years. Two years, six hours a week, generally bundled in 60 hours a week and then nothing for like six weeks. All right. We all have the plan. Yeah. And I guess for the last question that we have mm. before we, you know, mingle a little bit is what's next? You know, what's, what's next for you? What, what do you have um, over the next year or two years? What are you planning? Yeah, so I'm glutton for punishment, launching a new startup. And it's called Pumpkin Pie. And I guess the headline is it's like Tinder, but for friendship, for platonic friendship. And that, that will be out in November. Can people sign up already? Like a pre-sign up? It's or? in the app store under open beta. It's not that good. But if you want to take a peek and then, yeah, we'll be ready and we will be better in about two months. Awesome. Well, Andy, thank you so much. Um, you know, I know you and Manuela, so it was always great to see you. And also it was really awesome just to be able to sit up here and talk more about your story, hear you talk about that, have you share with the audience. And thank you so much to you all for coming out. Give yourselves a round of applause. Thank you. Give Andy a round of thank applause. You. Thanks. Thanks a lot. And feel free to make your way um, to get a water or a, a wine in, in, the, in the parlor back there. So thank you so much. Thank you, Jasmine. Thanks, everybody.
And don't forget, you could purchase a copy of Burn Rate on your way out to reception. <laughs>